the essential cognitive process that generates general conclusions from observations of uh, instances. Uh, many uh, psychological phenomena have been identified uh, in the previous decades, including the effect of similarity and so on and so forth. We need to account for these. And reasoning with heuristics, uh, heuristics are mental shortcuts useful for avoiding uh, high computational costs associated with uh, computing optimal exact conclusions. It's not guaranteed to be correct, but often useful. It's commonly used in human reasoning. For example, Tversky and Kahneman identify a number of these commonly used uh, heuristics. For example, representativeness heuristics, availability heuristics, and so on. We need to account for these also. There are also uh, a number of common patterns in uncertain reasoning. That is, drawing conclusions despite the lack of information, the lack of certainty of information, vague resemblance, and so on and so forth. For example, uh, these uh, different patterns are commonly found in uh, uh, everyday reasoning. We need to account for these also. In particular, I want to uh, mention this uh, uh, experiment for categorical inference. For example, subjects were presented an argument like this. All plants contain bryophytes, therefore all mosses contain bryophytes. And this seems to be just uh, uh, deductive reasoning because uh, all mosses are plants. And therefore, the conclusion is, uh, is perfectly strong. But what, we, what people found in experiments is that that's not the whole story. There's also a significant presence of similarity-based reasoning. Actually, this task shows very well the interaction of rule-based reasoning and similarity-based reasoning. I will uh, get into the detail later. And beyond the simple similarity-based processes, we may also want to deal with analogy, comparing different entities, objects, events, and so on and so forth, considering not only surface features, but also structural relationships. So we need the symbolic operations and structural mapping and so on. We can even uh, uh, extend that to a full-fledged first order uh, reasoning with uh, uh, variables and quantifier or even go to higher order reasoning. So what we need to deal with here is structural representation, representation of structures. For example, on a first order predicate calculus, schemas, inheritance hierarchies, and so on and so forth. But connectionist representations are usually flat, just a set of uh, nodes without structures. How do we represent deep structures using a flat connectionist representation? So that's an issue we will deal with in order to capture these types of reasoning. Now finally, uh, another important process is the intuitive process in reasoning. Uh, we need to understand how intuition develops and how insight emerges from uh, accumulating intuition. And this is important for dealing with the so-called insight problems. That is, uh, problems that may require insight to solve. Typically, these problems uh, have these characteristics. They are of high complexity, with potentially misleading problem representation, with ambiguous uh, constraints and operations, and so on and so forth. So simple deductive reasoning may not work in that case. And therefore, we need uh, intuitive processes. And uh, I will get into that also. So these are the phenomena that we want to account for within the cognitive architecture, plus many other, uh, many other phenomena in other domains of also. What we want here is a principled explanation, not based on parameter tweaking. Uh, there are many projects uh, using um, cognitive architecture that amounts to tweak parameters to match the data. Since cognitive architecture may be a Turing print, then uh, you can all you can always program uh, uh, a model that matches the human data. 
which uh, may or may not say much about underlying processes and mechanisms of human uh, cognition. We want to focus on generic psychological laws in narrow explanations of a large class of uh, phenomena, not just uh, specific instances. And we want a unified explanation of a wide variety of phenomena based on the same uh, cognitive architecture, the same uh, mechanisms and processes, hopefully a minimum set. Um, so we can co come up with unified explanations which may lead to unified theory of the mind. Uh, but on the other hand, computational simulation can also be useful. In case where there is no uh, generic logical law that we can uh, explain and account for, and uh, if we want to uh, get into further nuances and the details beyond the general psychological law, then we need computational simulations of specific uh, data sets. So we'll do both. First of all, a quick introduction to the carrion cognitive architecture, just to provide the background and tools we need for uh, dealing with uh, those reasoning phenomena. First of all, what is a computational cognitive architecture? To me, a computational cognitive architecture is a broadly scoped domain generic computational psychological model capturing the essential structures, mechanisms, and processes of the mind, which can be used for broadly scoped, multi-domain, multi-level analysis of behavior. It's like the architecture of a building. A cognitive architecture consists of the overall structures, that is, the essential divisions of modules, the essential relations between modules, as well as within each individual modules, the basic representation, essential algorithms, and so on. And uh, it includes uh, those aspects that are relatively invariant across time, domains, and individuals, described in a structurally and a mechanistically well-defined way. Its function is to provide a unifying framework to facilitate more detailed modeling and exploration of various components of the mind. So we specify a computational theory in a computational form. We embody our theory in computer program. The computer algorithms and programs uh, are just uh, another language for describing a more detailed, more precise theory of the mind. So let's uh, get to the carrying cognitive architecture, a specific cognitive architecture that I've been working on. It's a comprehensive, integrative cognitive architecture. Uh, I can reasonably claim it's more uh, comprehensive than uh, other existing cognitive architectures. It consists of a number of uh, distinct subsystems for different psychological functions. From a psychological point of view, at a minimum, a comprehensive model of the mind needs to include these things. Procedural processes for dealing with actions, skills, and so on. Declarative processes for dealing with reasoning and uh, uh, memory retrievals and so on and so forth. And metacognitive process and uh, motivational process. So the subsystems of the carrion cognitive architecture include the action-centered subsystem for dealing with procedural processes, the non-action-centered subsystem for dealing with declarative processes, and then we have the motivational subsystem and the metacognitive subsystem. Within each subsystem, there are two levels or two sets of modules interacting with each other with uh, different types of representation. So it's a dual representational uh, structure. One set of a module, the top level, encodes explicit knowledge. That is the knowledge that's uh, conscious or potentially conscious, you know, it's accessible. And uh, another set of a module, the bottom level, encodes implicit knowledge, knowledge that's not accessible, unconscious. <laughs> 
and uh, symbolic localist representations are used for encoding explicit knowledge. And at the bottom level, connectionist distributed representation is used to encode implicit knowledge. The two levels, of course, interact all the time by cooperating in action decision making or in uh, learning. So it's a due process theory of the mind which has become uh, more popular uh, recently. In particular, this kind of a duality of representation has been uh, extensively argued in my uh, uh, previous work, starting from the uh, early 1990s. So here is a diagram of the carrion cognitive architecture. It consists of uh, four major uh, subsystems, and they interact with each other. Uh, with those uh, uh, activation flows going in all directions. I'm not going to uh, get into the details at this point. And within each subsystem, uh, there are explicit processes at the top level and implicit processes at the bottom level. And they, of course, interact constantly. So let me uh, sketch some details of these subsystems. Uh, one subsystem is particularly relevant, that's the non-action center subsystem. So I will spend more time on this second subsystem and, and going over other subsystems very quickly. So first of all, the action center subsystem, which deals with the procedural processes, action decision making, skill, performance, and so on and so forth. In the bottom level, implicit procedural uh, knowledge uh, is uh, there. Those implicit reactive routines are either hardwired or learned um, through, say, try and error <coughs> learning, uh, mostly using, for example, uh, reinforcement learning algorithms from machine learning um, and a number of other learning methods. And it's modular, consists of different modules for dealing with different domains. It is essential uh, to cognition, but I'm not going to get into that point here. In the top level of the ACS, explicit procedural knowledge is captured in the form of uh, explicit action rules. Uh, with regard to learning, there are a number of uh, different um, possible methods. Uh, each level can learn their own knowledge separately or uh, the explicit knowledge can be learned on the basis of implicit knowledge, which is a bottom-up learning, or the other way around, which is top-down learning, and so on and so forth. So now let's get to the non-action center subsystem, which is the most relevant part here. So let's talk about that. The non-action center subsystem deals with uh, uh, declarative knowledge, that is general knowledge about the world performing various kinds of memory retrievals and inferences involving such knowledge. It's under the control of the ACS through its actions, and also it serves the purpose of uh, action decision making. It can help with the action decision making by the ACS. And knowledge is in the NACS uh, can be uh, learned uh, from within the NACS, but can also be transferred from the knowledge learned, accumulated within uh, ACS. And in turn, such knowledge can be used to help the learning and performance of the ACS. So there's a lot of uh, interactions. So at the top level of NACS, uh, explicit knowledge is encoded as a chunk nodes. Each chunk node represents a concept. And the links between chunk nodes encode explicit associations between concepts, known as associative rules. At the bottom level of the NACS, associative memory networks encode implicit declarative knowledge with distributed representations. And there are two way inter uh, links between the two types of representation. So once the chunk node at the top level for representing a concept is activated, through the top-down link, it will activate the corresponding features at the bottom level. And vice versa, if those features are activated, 
then uh, together they will activate the corresponding uh, chunk node at the top level. So how do we carry out uh, rule-based reasoning in this case? This is a very simple implementation. Rule-based reasoning is implemented with a simple weighted sum. In other words, this thing. I don't know if you can read it. I can't make this white. It turned out to be black. I don't know. <laughs> Unfortunately, I used the template provided by the summer school, and it has a rather dark background, so it's hard to read. But anyway, so this is just a weighted sum computation. So if the condition, those S are activated, then through the weighted sum, the conclusion is also activated. So these rules together form a, a linear network, a linear connectionist network. So that's the implementation of, uh, a simple implementation of rule-based reasoning, the simplest way uh, to uh, other methods later. And another type of reasoning that's essential to uh, ACS is similarity-based reasoning. Let me first outline the idea, and then I show you the implementation. This is not the implementation, just the idea. So if chunk CI is similar to chunk CJ, if concept I is similar to concept J, and if concept I is activated, is known, then the concept J is also activated, right? That's uh, through the similarity, so that's uh, quite straightforward. Now the question is how do we uh, calculate uh, similarity? So this is the full definition of similarity, and this is a simplified version. Let's look into the simplified version first. Basically, the similarity between the two chunks it's simply this. The sheer number of shared features between the two concepts divided by the number of uh, total features of the target concept. That's the similarity measure. And uh, so the full version is similar to that, except that each feature is weighted by this weight, V. So different features can play uh, different roles. Some are more important than others. So basically, that's the idea. And uh, so, the, uh, so, so this uh, similarity me measure is uh, asymmetric, of course. Just as uh, Tversky argued in his 1977 paper. So how do we implement this uh, similarity-based process? There's no separate mechanism for similarity-based reasoning. It doesn't exist. It's a byproduct of the interaction of the two levels of representation. Remember the chunk node and the feature nodes at the bottom level, chunk nodes at the top level, and the top-down activation flow, then bottom-up activation flow. And that's enough to implement those uh, similarity measures. Uh, so first of all, the top-down activation, once the chunk node is activated, it activates the corresponding feature nodes at the bottom level, and that's the weight. Uh, by default, it's just one, uniformly. And uh, then the bottom level processing, which we don't need to worry about at this point, and then the activation from the bottom level uh, goes up to activate the corresponding chunk node at the top level. Uh, so uh, that's the process. This is just the way the sum, okay? And the A sub I are just the activation of these features at the bottom level. And this is just the weight uh, for each feature in a bottom-up process. And this is the activation of the corresponding chunk node. And this V refers to this V and also refers to the V used in the definition of a similarity measure. You can easily verify that this process implements exactly the similarity measure that I defined earlier. In other words, carrying out this process based on this similarity measure. So how do we combine the result of similarity-based reasoning and rule-based reasoning? In other words, how do we combine the activation at the top level as a result of rule-based reasoning and activation from the bottom level, the bottom-up activation? 
To combine the two, we simply use the, the max operation and with the two scaling parameters, beta 1 and beta 2, uh, which uh, balance the two uh, uh, measures. And now the bottom level of the NACS, uh, it performs the processing and before the bottom up uh, uh, process. Uh, for example, a nonlinear fully recurrent attractor neural network can be used. The hot field type of network, if you are familiar with that. It performs uh, 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 soft constraint satisfaction. I don't know if you are familiar with that or not. If not, feel free to ask me questions. Uh, so it give a time, it will go through many, many iterations. It gradually uh, settle into a, a activation state, which satisfy as many constraints as possible. And that is uh, attracted in the network. So it performs that kind of soft constraint satisfaction by converging into an attractor. So here's the overall algorithm uh, performed by the NACS. Uh, information, input information is received at the both levels of the NACS. Then they simultaneously process the information at the, these two levels. Uh, the top level based on rules, you implemented using the weighted sum, the bottom level using that of your type network that I mentioned. And then we computed integrated activations by using this. And then we construct a hypothesis distribution, for example, using a Boltzmann distribution. And then we choose a response from that Boltzmann distribution. And then we check the termination condition. If a termination condition is met, then we return the result. And that's the end of uh, the operation of the NACS for this particular task. Otherwise, we go back to the, uh, to the beginning using the current result as a new starting point. And uh, so reasoning is performed within the NACS as I mentioned, rule-based reasoning at the top level, similarity-based reasoning through the interaction of the two levels, and the constraint-based processing, soft constraint-based processing at the bottom level. Of course, the top level can implement uh, hard constraint satisfaction process, but that's a separate story. And also, uh, it can perform a variety of different kinds of reasoning, just like the ACS. I'm not going to get into the detail. Here. So uh, here is a motivational subsystem, uh, very quickly, because uh, we uh, don't need that subsystem uh, for uh, the rest of the talk. Uh, the motivational subsystem is concerned with uh, why one does what one does, simply saying that an individual chooses actions to maximize payoffs, reinforcements, or rewards, leaves open the question of what determines these things. Uh, this subsystem contains uh, essential drives. Uh, those are basic needs, uh, uh, basic uh, motives uh, of uh, biological organisms. They lead to goals and then to actions within the ACS. And uh, it also provides a context in which the reinforcement for reinforcement learning within the ACS are determined. Within this subsystem, there is a dual representation. On the one hand, you have those uh, essential drives. And then at the top level, you have explicit goals. The explicit goals may be determined from those uh, uh, essential drives. Not going to get into the details here. So now the metacognitive sub subsystem. Uh, metacognition refers to one's knowledge concerning one's own cognitive processes and products and the control and the regulation of these processes. In Clarium, the metacognitive subsystem regulates the goal structure. It determines the goals based on drives and so on, but also cognitive processes per se for the sake of achieving goals. For example, we perform these uh, functions. Uh, setting of goals based on drives, 
setting of reinforcement based on goals and drives, uh, select, selecting input information, selecting output information, uh, selecting uh, learning methods, selecting reasoning methods, and so on and so forth based on drives, goals, and uh, the current situation. And of course, it determines uh, uh, explicit processing or implicit processing or a combination thereof. In other words, the degree of uh, explicit processing in a particular task. Again, I'm not going to get into the detail. So uh, let's move on to accounting for human reasoning within this uh, cognitive architecture. In a way, uh, accounting for these different types of uh, human reasoning within the Clarion cognitive architecture is a byproduct of developing the cognitive architecture. Uh, so let's see what it can do. First, let's look into accounting for intuitive processes and uh, the insight emergence and creative problem solving. The last topic I mentioned in, in terms of the scope of phenomenon to be accounted for. As I mentioned earlier, uh, creative problem solving deals with problem of high complexity with ambiguous constraint, ambiguous uh, 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 operations, and so on. So deductive reasoning may fail to solve these problems. That's why uh, intuitive processes are needed. Wallace proposed a four-stage decomposition of creative problem solving. The first stage is the preparation stage, involving the whole traditional art of logic, in other words, deductive reasoning. And uh, if preparation fails, if it, doesn't, if it does not fail, then problem solved. We don't need to go on. But if it fails, then the incubation stage uh, starts, during which we do not voluntarily or consciously think on a particular problem. Then after a while, uh, insight suddenly emerges, which is followed by the verification stage, which closely resembles the first stage of preparation, in other words, deductive reasoning for verifying the emerged idea. This uh, four-stage decomposition is very well accepted, but there's very uh, few uh, process theory, especially there's no process theory that's comprehensive enough to account for human level uh, creative problem solving. So here are a few existing uh, psychological theory of incubation, incubation only, just one stage. Uh, one theory is that incubation involves unconscious work, and therefore you don't remember what happened during that stage. You only know at the end of that stage, an uh, idea suddenly emerged. And conscious work theory says that you perform conscious work during this stage, but the conscious work is intermittent, and therefore you quickly forgot your work, and therefore it appears to be unconscious. And recovery from fatigue theory says that uh, the incubation period does nothing, basically. It's just uh, a period for recovery from mental fatigue. So you can tackle the problem anew. And uh, another theory says that this is a period of time for you to forget inappropriate mental set. So you can uh, uh, get onto the right path towards the solution, and so on. So here are a few existing theories of uh, insight. What is insight? Uh, one theory says that insight is an idea that satisfies a lot of uh, constraints of the problem, not necessarily all the constraints, uh, but an idea that maximizes the constraint satisfaction. That's what I remember. Anyway, the other theory says that insight is uh, obtained when you get out of uh, improper fixation through reorganization of visual information or through reorganization of mental representation or through reformulation of the problem and so on. And there are a number of other theories. <clears throat> 
So as you can see, these theories are fragmented, and we need a more unified theory. And uh, here is the carrion theory of creative problem solving. Here are the general principles of the carrion theory of problem solving. Number one, uh, uh, they are uh, uh, explicit knowledge and in implicit knowledge separately represented. And each piece of information may uh, represent in both implicit form and explicit form. And uh, they are uh, likely to, in, to be uh, simultaneously involved in most tasks. And uh, the result of implicit processing and explicit processing are integrated. And this process can be reiterated. So as you can see, this is uh, basically the principle of the carrying cognitive architecture. Nothing else, just the basic principles of carrying cognitive architecture. Here are a few uh, auxiliary principles, nothing particularly important. And so based on this carrying principle, we can interpret incubation and the insight, you know, with creative problem solving. And we can interpret the four stages proposed by uh, Wallace using the carrying framework. First of all, the preparation stage happens in the top level with the explicit processes, using explicit knowledge with the rule-based uh, processes. And if that fails, the information has already been received by the uh, implicit processes at the bottom level through top-down activation. And so the incubation stage happened in the bottom level with the implicit processes. Now, after many iterations of implicit processes, a stable activation pattern uh, uh, emerges. And then that stable activation pattern activates the corresponding representation at the top level. That's the inside stage, the emergence of insight into consciousness. And uh, then the verification stage follows, which uses the deductive reasoning to verify that insight. And so that's the process uh, within Clarion to carry out the creative problem solving. And uh, basically just what I described earlier, uh, receive input information and process at both level, and then combine the activation with a max, as I mentioned earlier, and then uh, generate a hypothesis distribution, and uh, then we look at the confidence level. If it's uh, above a threshold, then we output. Otherwise, we go back, uh, repeat the process. And the bottom level is a half field type uh, attractor neural network. At the top level is a linear network for implementing uh, associative rules. And there are cross-level connections. Uh, so there are top-down uh, activation, first, first of all. So the ch activate chunk nodes, activate the corresponding uh, feature nodes. And then the bottom level start to process through many iterations of the attractor neural network. And then we have the bottom-up activation. So the bottom-up activation will be combined with the top-level activation using the max that I mentioned earlier. Anyway, so uh, and uh, then we uh, construct a hypothesis distribution with uh, Boltzmann distribution. I know it's unreadable. But if anyone wants me to explain the basic idea of Boltzmann uh, distribution, I'd be happy to. I mean, I don't know uh, what I should explain, what I shouldn't. I don't know what you know, what you don't know. But anyway, so uh, is that better? It's much better. Oh, OK. So that's the Boltzmann distribution. Uh, OK, so if there's no question, I move on. And so now we look at the confidence level, which is just the 
uh, the activation uh, computed basically. And if it's greater than the threshold, then we, uh, this is the end. Otherwise, we start another iteration. And uh, this theory can account for these uh, existing theories of incubation and insight. For example, it accounts for the unconscious work theory. Because according to the Carrion theory of creative problem solving, incubation is, happens mostly in the bottom level with uh, implicit processes. So it naturally accounts for the unconscious work theory. And the process of uh, 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 settling into an attractor at the bottom level uh, reorganizes information. So in a way, it helps you to forget inappropriate mental set and get into the right attractor. So it accounts for that theory also. And one uh, main uh, assumption in the Carrion theory is that the top level explicit processes are more effortful and the bottom level implicit processes are less effortful. So the incubation happens mainly in the bottom level with the implicit processes. Therefore, it helps you to recover from mental fatigue as a side effect. And it also accounts for existing theory of insight. For example, uh, the uh, Hoffield type attracted neural network at the bottom level is known for performing soft constraint satisfaction. So the resulting pattern, the attractor, satisfy many uh, existing constraints. So it naturally accounts for the constraint theory of insight. And the fixation theory is similar to what I uh, mentioned earlier. And of course, it involves spreading activation and so on. This explanation may seem uh, a little simplistic, but if you look into the, the paper, it has more detailed analysis. I'll give you a reference later. So let me uh, show you some uh, examples of uh, simulations. Simulation of specific data sets or tasks is useful, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to capture the details. So let's look into Smith and Veller's uh, task. In this task, 50 line drawings were presented to each human subject. And after that, uh, they went through uh, two uh, recall tasks, one after another. And the length of the two tests uh, was varied. And the interval between the two tests, the incubation interval, was also varied. The length of the test durations were one minute, two minutes, or four minutes. And the length of the incubation interval uh, was uh, zero minute, one minute, five minute, or 10 minutes. And let's look at the human data. Uh, the x-axis shows the length of incubation interval. And the y-axis shows the so-called reminiscence score, which is the number of new words recalled during the second test, not recalled during the first test. As you can see, uh, the length of incubation interval makes a significant difference in terms of the reminiscence score, the longer the better. And on the other hand, the length of the test duration, you know, with these different bars, uh, didn't make a statistically significant difference. How do we explain this uh, result? So here is the simulation. The simulation based on Clarion captured this uh, human data pattern very well. Now the question is, uh, what does the simulation uh, say about the underlying process of uh, this task? Basically, the explanation provided by the simulation is this. Uh, because uh, 50 line drawings were presented uh, very quickly, so they don't really have uh, explicit memory of uh, those uh, uh, drawings or they have uh, implicit information, implicit constraints. And so the retrieval is mainly happening in the bottom level through that attractor neural network. And that attractor neural network is very slow. It goes through many iterations. So it takes time. The longer, the better. So you have a, a long 
incubation interval, even though they are not consciously think about that problem, the unconscious mind is working on that. They keep retrieving those uh, words. And uh, then they output those words at the beginning of the second test. So uh, that's why the longer the better. Well, here's another example uh, by uh, Schooler et al. In this task, subjects were asked to solve uh, puzzles, such as this one. Many puzzles. This is just one example. A dealer of antique coins got an offer to buy a beautiful bronze coin. The coin had an emperor's head on one side and the date 544 BC stamped on the other. The dealer examined the coin, but instead of buying it, he called the police. Oh, why? This one is easy, uh, but other puzzles, uh, believe me, are pretty difficult. So the subjects are asked to solve uh, these uh, problems. And one group of subjects were asked to verbalize while solving the problem. In other words, they had to think aloud all the time. Another group of subjects were uh, asked to do something completely unrelated. So in other words, they had a period for incubation. One group who verbalized had no incubation period. The other group had an incubation period. And here is a result. The group had the incubation period uh, performed significantly better than the uh, group who uh, didn't have the incubation period. Uh, the gray bars are the human data, and the black bars are the simulation data. So our simulation captured the human data very well. Incubation uh, is much better than uh, no incubation. Now, what kind of explanation does the uh, simulation provide to the underlying process of human performance? Uh, and this is because uh, people usually don't solve this problem through uh, deductive logical reasoning. People have a lot of uh, underlying uh, constraints about dates, about bronze, about coin, about metal, and so on and so forth. And uh, those constraints are working towards a, a solution state at the bottom level using the attract the neural network. And, uh, and this process, as I mentioned a number of times, takes time. So uh, if they were left alone doing something unrelated, listening to music or something like that, then the subconscious mind, the uh, half your type network can work on it. But if they ask to think aloud, the explicit processes are overly active, which impinge uh, explicit information on the implicit processes, preventing it from uh, working properly. So they uh, solved significantly less uh, problems as a result. So that's the explanation provided. So to summarize creative problem solving, uh, we account for uh, many existing theories. And we also simulated and explained a great deal of empirical data using the Clarion theory of creative problem solving. And this theory uh, results directly from the Clarion cognitive architecture almost without any, well, completely without any uh, uh, addition to it. Uh, and uh, within the, beyond the theory, the general framework, within the Clarion cognitive architecture, there are a lot of uh, detailed representation mechanisms and processes. So we can simulate a variety of uh, data, uh, not just in uh, creative problem solving, but also in other domains of reasoning and in other psychological domains. So let's move on to another uh, task, which I mentioned earlier, the categorical inference uh, task using Clarion. This task is a little different, but using essentially the same mechanism. This is uh, Sloman's task. Uh, he uh, asked subjects to judge these uh, different arguments, 
So one argument is this: all flowers are susceptible to thrips. Therefore, all roses are susceptible to thrips. I don't know what thrips is. I mean, I suspect the subjects didn't know either. It doesn't really matter. It's just the form of the、uh, argument. And another argument is this: all plants are susceptible to thrips, and therefore all roses are susceptible to thrips. And subjects are asked which argument in each pair of arguments. Is stronger, and they are also asked to rate the strengths of each argument. Now, if you look at the、uh, each argument, and if you are a logician, then、uh, it's a simple deductive reasoning, right? Because the roses are flowers. If all flowers are susceptible to thrips, then of course roses are susceptible to thrips. There's no surprise. There's no、uh, doubt. There's no ambiguity at all, but that's not the result、uh, people found in human experiments with this task or other similar tasks. So people are not doing this based only on logic or on rule-based reasoning or on deductive reasoning. So here's the human data.、Uh, Eighty-two percent of the People、uh, selected the, the argument that goes from flower to rose to be stronger than the argument go, going from、uh, plant to rose. And the average、uh, likelihood rating of the argument is 0.86, not one. If you believe uh, uh, logical reasoning is、uh, the process used by human subjects. Then you would expect the result to be one because they are perfectly strong, but that's not the case. So,、uh, besides、uh, deductive reasoning, rule-based reasoning, there is a significant presence of similarity-based reasoning in this task. Because if only rule-based reasoning was used, then the, the argument strengths.、Uh, Uh, it, uh, people should choose、uh, each argument 50% of the time, a- and also the likelihood rating of these arguments will be one. So here is a carrying simulation, and、uh, 83% of the time it chooses、uh, flower to rose argument over plant to rose, and the average likelihood rating is 0.87. These numbers are very similar to the human data, capture the human data very well. Now, what kind of explanation does the simulation provide us about this task? So, let's look into the simulation setup, which provides a mechanistic interpretation of the mechanism and the process of performing this task. So, first of all, the top level contains those、uh, background knowledge. For example, flowers and plants, roses are, are flowers, and so on and so forth. And task-specific knowledge, for example, flowers are susceptible to thrips. At the bottom level, the features of those concepts are represented、uh, in terms of features. And uh, the, the uh, very important、uh, parameter is this: beta one and beta two, which is the scaling parameters for balancing. Rule-based reasoning and similarity-based reasoning. So in this case, beta one is 0.5 and beta two is one. And、uh, so here is the process.、Uh, so let's look into this argument.、Uh, let's see. Let's look into this first argument. All flowers are susceptible to thrips. And therefore, all roses are susceptible to thrips. So, first of all, uh, the uh, the chunk node for rose is activated, and uh, then uh, the activated chunk nodes activate the features at the bottom level. And similarity-based reasoning, as I said earlier, is accomplished through a bottom-up activation of these feature nodes to activate other.、Uh, Chunk nodes. 
representing other concepts. And at the same time, rule-based reasoning is also uh, performed at the top level. So in proloses of flowers, so flowers are also activated. And through similarity-based reasoning, flowers are also activated because similar to rows. Okay, so the two types of activation of the same uh, uh, concept, flowers, are combined using max with the two scaling parameters, beta 1 and beta 2, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, then uh, we uh, decided the activation level of uh, that concept, flower. And then we repeat that process. We can go from flower to strips and so on. So that's the basic process. Now, there are also other experiments, variations on these experiments, which provide interesting insight into uh, the interaction between uh, rule-based reasoning and similarity-based reasoning in this task. Now, one variation is this. Uh, subjects were presented uh, this argument instead. The difference here is the category inclusion relation is uh, explicitly included. So before it was uh, all plants contain uh, bryophytes and therefore all mosses contain bryophytes. Now all mosses are plants is included as part of the argument. So here's a human result. The mean likelihood rating is almost one. So in other words, the similarity effect almost disappeared. It's almost completely based on logic, based on uh, rule-based reasoning. That's because of this categorical inclusion relations that emphasized rule-based reasoning. And another variation is this. Uh, before the experiments uh, began, subjects were asked to uh, make categorical uh, inclusion relation judgment. So they were asked this question, are mosses plants, are loses flowers, and so on and so forth. Now after all these uh, categoric inclusion uh, judgments, then they will present those uh, arguments. Those arguments uh, include no uh, category uh, inclusion relations at all. So here's a human result. The mean likelihood rating is a 0.92. So there is a similarity effect. It's just uh, not as strong as before. In the original experiment, the result is a 0.86, I believe. So the similarity effect is reduced, but the similarity effect is present compared with uh, this variation. So it's somewhere in between. So uh, how do we uh, explain this process? So here's a simulation uh, using Clarion. These variations according to Carrion, amounts to manipulating the weight of rule-based reasoning in relation to similarity-based reasoning. So the explicitly stating the inclusion uh, relations in the argument itself uh, amounts to setting the beta 1 to 1, in other words, from 0.5 to 1. You emphasize the rule-based reasoning. So the simulation result, 0.99, very similar to the human data. Now, making those category inclusion judgment ahead of the time leads to beta 1 to be set at 0.88, which is lower than 1.0, but higher than 0.5 in the original simulation. So the result of the simulation is 0.91, very similar to the human data. So it accounts for these uh, uh, results by adjusting the, the emphasis on the rule-based reasoning in relation to the similarity-based reasoning. One thing I should have mentioned here is that those questions are answered very quickly. They didn't ask subjects to go back, sleep on it, and then come back and give the answer. So uh, what does that mean? It means that the attractive neural network at the bottom level which requires many iterations and often a long time to settle into an attractor is not involved 
It's just the top-down activation and then bottom-up activation, plus the rule-based reasoning within the top level through that linear uh, network. That's it. The Hoffield network, uh, the attractor network, was not significant in this particular case. How much time do I have? I don't have the time anymore. Uh, just a few minutes. OK, so uh, uh, what I was going to talk about, which I'm not going to, given that I have just a few minutes, is accounting for general psychological law. For example, the representativeness heuristics can be accounted for by Karen in a way that's very similar to the accounting of, uh, of a categorical uh, 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 inference uh, task. And uh, we can also account for those biases which uh, Tversky and Kahneman explained using those uh, heuristics. So if we can explain those heuristics, of course, we can explain those uh, biases, for example, base rate neglect, uh, conjunction fallacy, and also availability heuristics and associated uh, uh, biases, a search set, retrievability, and so on. We can account for inductive reasoning in a way that's uh, almost exactly the same as our accounting of the categorical inference task. Uh, one is a more deductive, the other one is more inductive, but the mechanism for accounting for both are almost exactly the same. I mean, they're based on the same mechanism, although used in a slightly different way because of uh, the stimuli is a little different. Anyway, so uh, accounts for those effects associated with uh, inductive reasoning and uh, a number of other uncertain uh, reasoning uh, cases that I mentioned earlier. And one thing I do want to mention is that for first order reasoning and for complex analogy, there are some uh, preliminary work in that direction within the Clarion framework. And uh, I cited some reference here. So um, Clarion can be used to capture and therefore explain uh, computationally many psychological phenomena of human reasoning in a principled and a unified way, in addition to providing explanation to many other uh, psychological phenomena in other domains. And these explanations are mostly structural and principled without parameter tweaking. And that shows, to some extent, the psychological validity and the generality of Clarion. And here are a few most relevant uh, papers uh, uh, relevant to what I talked about. For example, the creativity, the creative problem solving and the uh, intuitive processes paper, uh, is discussed in this paper. And uh, categorical inference task is described in this paper. And uh, uncertain reasoning patterns described in this paper, very old paper. And uh, here are two most relevant books. Uh, one is an uh, early one about uh, reasoning that's very old, um, probably should ignore that. And this one is a more recent, just published, which discusses not just the reasoning, but other, many, many other aspects of the carrying cognitive architecture. Thank you. Thank you.